Hello and welcome to the Slackware Arm Vlog. First of all, I just want to say thank you for your donations and support that help keep the project going. Uh, if you'd like to help, um, then you can type in the URL that's just down here on the screen. And really that helps keep the lights on. It keeps helping with paying for new hardware, um, for either new stuff or inevitably when things break. And of course, it also pays for some of the electricity and that kind of stuff. And really just helps keep the whole project momentum going really. So thank you very much for your support. In this episode, we're going to uh, begin the process of upgrading from Linux 6.10 to Linux 6.11. So that's the kernel. And I'll walk you through the process of how I upgrade the kernel and how I test the kernel on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi Rock Pro 64, which I've got on my desk here, got both of those and then the Honeycomb LX2, which is uh, away elsewhere. So I'll talk you through how I begin upgrading the kernel, looking at the um, configuration, the kernel configuration, and then how do I go about testing the packages on the different machines. Um, and then finally, maybe I'll even do a reinstall. Not, we'll see how it goes, but that's what we'll do in this episode. So let's get going. Okay. so. The first thing I need to do is to copy the existing kernel source in the Slackware ARC64 tree. And so that I can create a working in, prog a work in progress version without overriding the existing um, kernel source. Rather, the, without overwriting the existing kernel um, configuration for Linux 6.10. So I'll copy the kernel directory, which is the K to K whip like that. And this way it's independent from the, the version that we currently have, uh, which is Linux 6.10. So I'm going to kernel whip like that. Um, go into sources, remove the Linux 6.10 uh, source. And then I will just grab the 6.11 source from the Slackware64 tree, because that way I don't need to verify it because it's already been verified upstream. Now at this point, there is a file in here called do src, and I'm going to run that with a parameter of n and press enter. So what this does is it this is a script I've written that helps me move through, sequentially move through different kernel upgrades. Uh, it basically all it does is it just unpacks the kernel into the into the RAM disk um, for speed and then runs make oh it applies any patches there currently aren't any uh, copies the dot config file and then runs make old config so what I'm going to do now ordinarily between versions say 6.10.13 uh, and 6.10.14 so uh, minor releases there usually aren't that many configuration options to uh, to change or to check or that are new um, but when it comes to a major release like 6.11 to, uh, sorry, from 6.10 to 6.11, there's usually quite a few. So what I'll do now is just move through the configuration here. Um, I won't walk you through all of this, um, but usually if I don't know what these are, I just, um, you know, press the question mark and then read about what it means. And then in this case, it says San N is unsure. I think that's supposed to be say. So we'll just put N on that one and press enter. Um, and it's things like this. Well, I don't need to care about that because the build script already takes care of it, so it doesn't matter. So, yeah, so I'll run through all of these and uh, then I'll come back to you when that's done. So I've now completed the make old config section. So I have a config file that is ready uh, to be used. Now, um, the script has already copied the new config file into the place. Uh, in, sorry, it's copied it in place, so it's ready to be used. The kernel is ready to be built. Um, in this case, also the temporary extraction directory remains. So usually I'll do this if there's any manual configuration changes that I want to make. For example, if you guys ask on the forum for anything, then I can just CD into this directory and manually add those in and take care of those. So I'm now back in the kwip directory and it's time to build a kernel. Ordinarily, when I upgrade the kernel, I just run the, there's a script in here called finalize, which 
launches the build script and it upgrades the kernel package on the build machine as well. But because this is a major kernel upgrade, I don't want to touch the build machine at all because if the kernel doesn't work, then my primary build machine is going to be out of action. I have to manually go in there and unplug things and fix it and everything. I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is build, run a script called build test kernels, which um, sets up all the parameters to build a kernel package and the installer outside of the Slackware tree um, so that then I can, in this case, upload it to the Raspberry Pi or the, and, and the Rock Pro 64 and that are the, the sitting on my desk. So if those don't work, it's non-disruptive to the um, development process. I can simply unplug them and fiddle around with them. So, so uh, first of all, let's um, see. Okay, so that's a piece of work that's finished off there. So source k whip. So we'll run this under screen, build test kernels, and there we go. So I'll come back in a couple of hours and those kernels would have been built. Okay, so let's see where we are. The packages have now built, the kernel packages and the installers have built as well. And we get two versions of the installer. We get the, what I call the bare installer, which is just the Slackware installer packaged on uh, into um, SD card images for the particular hardware models because they all, they're all slightly different. Um, and then we've got the all-in-one installer, which is the same bare Slackware installer image, but the SD card, or, well, the, the, the disk image, we can call it, has an additional partition um, that holds the full Slackware installation media. So in other words, the packages that you're going to install. So it's a all-in-one installer. You just in, you just um, uh, dump the installer image to an SD card or a USB stick or what have you, boot it, and then you can install directly without any, you know, it's completely offline. So you don't need the internet, you don't need anything else. Okay, so those have all built and we can, so those are the packages. We just have a quick look. Uh, uh, where are we? Slack, yeah. So Slackware, let's give it a quick look. So um, that's the SD card image. Okay, so it should be H, I can read it, human readable form, that's better. Right, so 348 megs. Um, so that's the SD image. Then the installer image is 13 gigs. Oh yeah, because it's got, okay. Um, oh, right, yeah, because they're, they're uncompressed, that's why. Um, so that's the disk image, that expands to 13 gigs, and we recommend 16 gigs. Well, you need 16 gigs. Uh, those are the bare installer, so that's just the, the, the actual image, the CPI of archive. Uh, what else do we have? Those are the bare, those are for booting over TFTP. Oh, DTPs, don't want those. Oh no, tons of DTPs. Um, and we've got the kernels modules package and the kernel base package. In a future uh, video, we'll be m migrating or rather consolidating these two packages, the kernel modules and the kernel ARMv8, into a single kernel ARMv8 package. More on that later. Kernel headers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it kind of looks all right. Right. Now, the thing, here's the thing. So my build machine... Um, at the moment, I've only got one master build machine, which is the Honeycomb LX2. I do have others, but they're currently switched off. Um, so this one, I need to make sure that it's in a good working state, because if there are any problems with the kernel, then I will rebuild it on here, on the main, on the master build machine, because it only takes an hour or so to build the, kernel, the full kernel and the installers. So what we need to do is to transfer this onto the... Um, one of the test machines. So we're going to use the Raspberry Pi to test it with. So first we need to boot the Raspberry Pi. Okay, we now need to turn on the Raspberry Pi 4. So just quickly, the Raspberry Pi 4 is quite easy to turn on when you've got this inline power switch um, and it's quite colorful as well. So that's powered on and we should see that booting. Yep, there we go. So see the machine is booting here and I've also got it all um, connected to the serial console of another Linux box 
Okay, so the machine has booted and I'm gonna log in over the serial console. And this is when I realize I need to copy the uh, this packages, which I haven't done yet. So uh, experimental slack where Anton Urban X611. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy these packages onto a shared storage so I can grab them from um, the, uh, the Raspberry, grab them onto the Raspberry Pi. Okay, perfect. So then let's just uh, mount hd hd develop arm slack and temp linux temp linux 6.11 a. So what we'll do is we'll upgrade the kernel mod, we'll upgrade these packages. We don't need the source package, the kernel source or the headers or anything like that. So yeah, we're currently running the mainline Linux 6.10.14 and we're going to upgrade to 6.11.5. Hopefully the upgrade process should be clean. Shouldn't be any errors reported there. What I'm going to do though is just, uh, oh, okay, so rm screen zero rpi screen 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 <laughs> screen dash r so i'm just going to log the uh serial output using screen so it's just going to log it there so i can refer to it if there are any errors um quickly i'm just going to show you this is just a really basic testing process that i use um so when i perform kernel upgrades for major releases so 6.10 to 6.11 for example these are just the, the basic checks that I do. So I, I perform an initial kernel major version upgrade, which is what I'm just doing right now. Then I perform a minor kernel upgrade. So in this case, it means uh, we're going to be what? Uh, oh, okay. We're upgrading to Linux 6.11.5. So I will then upgrade to Linux 6.11.6 .6, and I'll test the, um, the, the minor upgrade process as well. Uh, usually there's never any problems with that. It's usually if there's anything, it's going to be the major, it's going to be the, between the major releases, but I test it anyway. Um, I leave that running for a few days and then I reinstall the machine um, from the bare installer, which is the installer that doesn't have any of the Slackware packages. So it's, a, it's only a few gigs. Um, I will then perform graphical tests. So X11, for example, network tests, well, they, they get tested as we use the machine anyway. And then I just leave it running for three or four days. Oh, that's, that's slightly wrong. So, and then, um, so yeah, basically I leave it for a week to soak test the kernel. Uh, and then I, um, in the case of the Raspberry Pi 4, I'll then build the Raspberry Pi kernel fork and test that as well and push them all out live. Um, so this is actually in the wrong column there. Um, yeah, and I'll boot, as you'll see, I'll boot the machine using a serial console so I can capture any errors. That's basically how it works. Okay, so this is just finishing off that process. And hopefully, once we reboot the machine, it should boot correctly. I have noticed that the kernel has increased in size by about 10 megs, um, which is mm, should be okay, but you never know. I might have to slim it down somewhat. Um, I haven't, we haven't had any issues upgrading for the major between major releases for quite a while now, so I'm kind of hoping that uh, we're good with this one as well. Uh, release, yeah, 6.10.14. So we'll now reboot the machine, and we're logging the um, boot already. So we'll hopefully see it boot correctly, and if not, then I'll be capturing the error messages and uh, I can look at rectifying that. Of course, this is also why I'm, test, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the boot test on um, disposable machines. So these machines on my desk in the office are disposable installations. They're, they're only used for testing um, kernel upgrades and graphical stuff and things like that. Whereas the, the main build machine, uh, which is here, this one here, Honeycomb, uh, this one here, this is the master build machine. So we need to keep that in a good working state for as long as possible. But the other machines can be disposed, they can be reinstalled pretty easily. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. So that's loading the operating system initial RAM disk. 
and that's a few hundred megs in size so it does take a little while then the kernel image yeah there we go okay so it's booting please work i don't want to spend all day fixing you <laughs> right <laughs> praying to the deities of linux okay um okay Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Did not. Okay. Looks fine so far. Okay. Fine. Yeah. That's fine. Right. Okay. So the question is, do we have any networking? That's always a good start. Yeah, we do. Okay. That's good. And found the wireless too. Perfect. Um, what we're going to do now, this kernel has clearly booted and I didn't see any issues at all. I'll just quickly check dmessage just in case, but I didn't see any. Um, no, nope, looks good. I also need to check the ROTPRO64, um, but as, as an initial boot test from a major migration of 6.10 to, sorry, of a migration from 6.10 to 6.11, this is enough. I don't need to test that on the ROTPRO64. Okay, so I'm back on the master build machine now, and we need to uh, build the latest kernel. So if I delete the Linux 6.11.5, okay, so there already is a Linux 6.11.6. .6. So what I'm going to do is grab that from the from the slackware source like this okay so then this way we've booted we've proven that we can do an upgrade from 6.10 to 6.11 and now i want to to prove the i can have a safe upgrade between 6.11.5 and 6.11.6 .6. so we need to build the kernel um so we can do this and this is the same process as i ran for uh, upgrading 6.10. Um, this time it should, there probably aren't any configuration changes because it is a major, uh, it is only a minor upgrade. So I'll quickly do that. Okay. But so far, all good. Done. Okay. So then we just do the same thing again. Build this under screen if we're not already under screen. Okay, so I'll build test kernels just like that and leave it to build. Once that's done, then we will perform the next step, which is upgrading to the new kernel we've just built. And we'll do that on the Raspberry Pi 4 and then we'll do a reinstall and um, probably call this video good after we've left it for a few days. Okay. Okay, so the new Linux 6.11.6 .6 packages have been built. So let's then copy those to the um, shared storage, Linux. Da, da, da. Uh, a. Okay, so I'm gonna copy these new kernel packages into the shared storage so that I then on the Raspberry Pi 4 can upgrade to them. So here is the Raspberry Pi 4. Okay. And so do I mount everything or not? No, mount, there we go. No, not that. Uh, Oh, uh, TMP Linux. Okay. And okay, so we can upgrade. Just check whether that is still logging. Yeah, it is good. Okay. So hopefully there shouldn't be any errors here, um, particularly because there weren't any when upgrading from the previous major release 6.10. So I don't anticipate any, any errors appearing here. But you never know. <laughs> it's always worth being optimistic. Okay, so the package tools are removing the existing version of the package. I've actually been thinking about 
submitting a patch to Patrick at some point to quell the verbosity or to reduce the verbosity of this because in most cases you don't re I mean personally I never really look that much at this stuff um, it's kind of unnecessary and it actually does take longer <laughs> okay it's not not just by a few seconds but I mean you know. Mind you, actually, these days, I don't tend to look at this stuff that much anyway. It's only when I'm sitting there babysitting it like I am at the moment. OK. All right, this will just be a moment. So this is upgrading the kernel package. As I said, um, pretty soon I'm going to, once I've pushed out 6.11, I will look at merging the kernel modules and the kernel package. And... Uh, so it's not actually necessary, but it's safer. And it's what also is, is what's been, uh, that movement has already taken place in the x86 um, progenitor platform. So I will do it here because it's safer for the automated upgrade of the, or rather the automated rebuild of the operating system initial RAM disk. Because at the moment you need to upgrade the kernel modules package first followed by the kernel package, otherwise the operating system initial RAM disk can't um, uh, well yeah it basically will, would be rebuilt with the older version of the kernel modules. So yeah so combining the two packages will solve that problem. I did think about updating package tools to be able to signal between two packages when it, during the upgrade process but that's quite a bit of code and I doubt Patrick would want to accept that, and I don't fancy carrying my own patch. So, merging it into a single f into a single package makes a lot of sense, and it's so much easier. Right. Okay. So that has been upgraded. Um, where are we here? I think we are through the serial console. Perfect. So, I'm just going to actually remove SP0 because I don't need that anymore. And begin the logging again. So I'm, I am already logged in through the serial port, which is this um, serial line here, TTYS1. So I will be able to see the machine booting um, over the serial console and be able to capture the boot messages. So I'll be able to see if there are any error messages here. I'm sure there won't be though, given that we've already booted 6.11 without incident okay so this is the bootloader now okay just give that a second a couple of seconds and it will boot slackware i'm just watching it as the messages scroll by because it's usually quite easy to detect errors visually i don't see any and again, of course, if I do detect any, I can just scan the serial console log. That's okay. No erase. Yeah, fine. Uh, oh, what? Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay. Fine. Looks good. Okay, cool. Ooh. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Right. What I'll do now is I'm just going to leave this for a couple of days just to make sure it's in a good state, and then I'll reinstall it. The Raspberry Pi 4 has now been up for couple of days uh, running the Linux 6.11.6 .6 kernel and I'm just going to run the message see if there's anything I could have. so there are no critical errors that have been surfaced here because if they were they'd usually appear here in D message in a kernel ring buffer so um, what I want to do now is reinstall the Raspberry Pi and the way that the Slackware installer works is that the um, we for the Raspberry Pi and also the Rock Pro 64 and the Pinebook Pro, we deliver the installer as an image that you copy onto your SD card, and the Slackware installer converts the SD card image into the boot partition, which is the one I'm selecting here. So that becomes the operating systems slash boot partition. And uh, you know the system boots from that, and this is where the kernel, um, where's the kernel? 
here. The kernel and the with yeah, and the initial RAM disk here, or the OS init ID, as we call it in Slackware Arm. The op the initial RAM disk here and the kernel here. That's where they reside, and then the um, the device tree blobs for flattened device tree as well. So all of the boot stuff lives in there. And additionally, on the Raspberry Pi, we also have the um, this slash boot slash platform slash HWM underscore BW. HWM stands for hardware model. BW stands for bootware. And this is where the Raspberry Pi um, uh, proprietary bootloader stuff lives. So this like start elf, some of the bits and bobs, bin code and all that stuff. And the DTBs, they also reside in here. So this is taken from the um, the this start elf stuff. This this bootloader stuff is taken from the Raspberry Pi repository. And SLK image is the Slackware kernel. SLK init ID is the Slackware initial RAM disk. And then this is U-boot here. So um, all of this stuff here, this is actually the latest kernel and the latest init ID. Um, these are actually populated into this directory in addition to slash boot. Um, use it from the kernel package itself. There's actually a helper script that copies these in, these in place when, you, uh, when you're when you using a Raspberry Pi. Anyway, um, so now the thing is that this machine is currently working and the way that the installer works is that we have to deploy it to an SD card, which is fine, um, apart from if the installer doesn't work, it means that my machine won't boot anymore because the OS has been, the, the operating system's boot partition has been deleted, been destroyed. So what I want to do is, um, is I want to test the Slackware installer by, by booting it over the network because that way it's a completely non-disruptive um, process. So what I'm going to do, I'm logged in over the serial console, TTYS1. So uh, let's reboot the machine and we will find ourselves within the U-boot bootloader console. And I'm going to interrupt the U-boot -boot bootloader um, to access the console. And from there, I will cause it to boot over the network. Um, so it's going to load like 400 megs of, or oh, it's more than that actually, I think. It's going to, oh, I need to press enter, right? So if I'm just going to press enter here, I'm now accessing the, I'm now at the U-boot console. So I've got access to U-boot. So U-boot on the Raspberry Pi is actually, has been booted from the SD card. Because on, on Slackware, we use the U, we, we actually, the way it's actually done, Brent um, uh, did this for us. We actually chain load U boot from the um, sort of official Raspberry Pi binary uh, proprietary bootloader, which I think is from Broadcom. Um, so we don't have the source to that, no one does. Um, it's not open source. One of the things I don't like about the Raspberry Pi ecosystem. But let's, <laughs> let's leave that there because that's just <laughs> another reason. Um, so what we do is we boot, we chain load from um, the Raspberry Pi proprietary bootloader into the open source bootloader U-boot, and then from there we boot the Slackware Linux kernel and the operating system. All right, now switching screens into, this is the Slackware AART64 tree. In the root directory of it, we have a directory called installer. In there, we have a directory called tfdp, and then there, we have a couple of script, well, a handful of scripts. And we have a file called how to use. So, basically, this just tells you how to um, network boot the installer. Uh, now, I've got everything set up already for my on my end, so all I need to do is just find this one. So, I don't need, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just paste this in. So it's transferred the the script. So this here is, um, I've actually loaded into RAM this script here, which is a U-boot script that instructs U-boot to download the kernel and the initRD and set the system up ready to boot. And now all I need to do is call that script using the source command and supply the memory base address like that. And hopefully that will boot the installer Okay, so it's booting the kernel image. Now it's downloading the Slackware installer. And this will take a little while because it's quite large. And there'll be a couple of timeouts. There are always these T's here means 
that TFTP suffered a timeout whilst it was transferring, so it retries. But yeah, this takes a while, but it is easier for me this way in case the machine becomes, or rather in case the installer doesn't boot, um, it's easier for me to do it like this than it is to extract the SD card and insert it into another machine and then copy it on and everything. It's just, oh, okay, that was fast. Um, yeah. It took much longer to load the installer on the um, Rock Pro 64 because I also network booted it there as well for the same reason. Um, different hardware. Okay. Uh, so the kernel's booted. It was booting. Looks good so far. Oh, I'm not sure I logged the. Yeah, there we go. I didn't log the boot messages. That's okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. We have network. That's a good start. All right. Okay. So we've got network. We know about that. What about disk? SDA. Yeah, we have the SSD on a USB um, to start a converter. Cool. Uh, and then we've got the SD card here with the partition for the Raspberry Pi proprietary bootloader and then the Linux, well, the Slackware installer. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is I'm going to, uh, hold on a minute, rock slash Q, slack dish SA64 install, right. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so what I'm doing now, because the installer has booted correctly, I'm now writing the Slackware installer to the SD card in the mic. Uh, I'm writing the Slackware installer to the SD card in the Raspberry Pi, and that way we can boot properly into the um, Slackware installer and set the installer going. And um, as I said, because you can't, I mean. At the moment, we, we can, we've booted the Slackware installer, but the way that the Slackware installer for ARM is built, it expects, on the Raspberry Pi, it expects to be able to access the SD card and transform it into the slash boot partition. But because, um, uh, because, the, because the SD card already contained a slash boot partition, the installer won't work properly on there. I mean, you could make it work. I could hack it up to make it work, but it's just not worth it. Um, so yeah, this is just simply, can I boot the installer uh, and will, does it work um, as, as a non-destructive test? Uh, the other, I mean, one of the other reasons you can boot the installer is for, over the network, is for troubleshooting. Um, so it's really quite useful for being able to do that. Okay, so the installer has written and it's ready to reboot. So we can press enter now, like that. And the installer will reboot back into the U-boot bootloader. And at that point, we should also see it boot up on the screen. Yeah, there we go. So you can see here, there's, there we're following it over the serial console. And we also have it on the screen as well on the HDMI monitor. Okay, so I'm keeping an eye on the monitor. So there's this, it's booting over the serial console. There we go. It's brought, it's brought up the frame buffer now. And we're going to be conducting the installation using the HDMI monitor and USB keyboard because that's what's in the, in the install guide. Um, although, I mean, realistically, I could also just install it over the serial console or over SSH as well, but um, I, I always replicate what's actually in the installation guide um, to make sure that everything works as expected. So you can see over the serial console, it's fetching the network. Okay. All right. So I can now press enter like that. And press one to choose it. Oh, I've knocked the I think I've knocked the cable out. And oh, there we go. Uh, can press one to pick a key map. It's quite difficult doing this one-handed. And 
choose the UK map because that's what kind of what I'm using. Well, it's not actually, I think it's a French keyboard, but never mind. Okay, right, so then I will run the setup and leave that going. Okay, so I've just performed a little bit of the setup config and we're ready to go. So I'm gonna be installing over NFS. I select everything for the install. Do a full, we'll do with a terse installation there. Okay, so it's now installing and I'll keep an eye on that and then come back afterwards to complete it. Okay, so the installation has completed. I've also been following on the serial console to check if there are any errors reported through the package installations and there weren't, so that's good. You just need to complete the installation. So yes, we will remove the Slackware installer. Um, don't need to configure the console settings. Okay, we'll leave that as it is, yeah. Network, we'll call it RPI4. Um, um, dot slack where dot com. Network manager, yeah, looks good, yeah. And I'll start RPC for NFS, although I probably won't use it this time, but never mind. Okay, start it anyway. Uh, yes, we'll pick TR732B, which is the one we're currently using in the installer. Accept it. No, it's hardware clock. London. Vim will be fine. Uh, we'll pick XFCE. Set ourselves a password. Okay. Exit, reboot. Okay, so at this point, we can see uh, we've got the monitor plugged in, of course, and we, we can see now it booting on the HDMI monitor, and we can also follow it along on the serial console. So we'll see the output on the serial console first. Um, at least when once the kernel's booted, we will. Uh, and then once the frame buffer, graphical frame buffer support is loaded into the kernel, then we will also see that appear, we'll see the output appearing on the monitor. So at the moment, it's just loading, what is it? Loading the OS in SRD. So the initial RAM disk for the operating system. Then it will load the kernel and then boot. And then touch wood a bit, <laughs> it boots. It should be fine because we've already booted it from within the previous installation. So there we go. You can see it's uh, surfacing its messages onto the HDMI monitor now. Looks good. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing any issues at the moment. So let's just quickly add myself a user. Okay. All right. Let's switch to the other console. Okay. Bring you back in. So I've created myself a user for my um, for myself for my pleb account without privileges, and we'll just try StarTex. Oh, actually, what's the date on this? Oh, that'll do, yeah, that's fine. Start X, not quite right, but it's good enough. Start X, whoop, start X. Okay, must, hopefully this works. I haven't tested X on the Raspberry Pi for absolutely ages. Okay, we've got a mouse cursor, so, that, so that's always a good start. We're just using XFCE here. Hopefully that works. Yeah, cool. Awesome, well that's that's pretty good. Okay, so we'll leave that alone for the weekend. Um, make sure the machine's stable and then finally next week we'll build the Raspberry Pi kernel fork packages and I think we're good to go. Okay, so now that we've built the kernel packages from kernel.org, we need to build the kernel packages from 
the Raspberry Pi's GitHub repository. So this is what we call the kernel fork, the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. So we go into the build alt alt uh, alt kernel .conf directory like that, and we edit the RPI file, and we just change this to Linux six point eleven like that. So there should be a six point eleven branch here. Oops, 6.11. Yeah, there we go. So 6.11.y. So we just match that with the 6.11 as I've just done here. Okay. All right. And then, okay. So I'll just build that under screen. We have a shell script here called RPI finalize, which is just, um, well, as it says here, it builds the RPI kernel fork packages and deposits them within the correct location, ready for publishing. So that's what that does. And we can then just build that here. And this should just provide the information we have, 6.11, yeah, little review and press enter to begin building. Okay, so we'll leave those to build and that'll probably take about 25 minutes, something like that. Okay, so the Raspberry Pi kernel fork packages have built, but it's occurred to me that I haven't explained if you are new to the channel, new to Slackware on ARM and the Raspberry Pi, what exactly am I talking about? So if we search for Slackware ARM in our search engine, click on the top link, which is usually the ARM, the official ARM Slackware website. And if we go to development home, I think, yeah, development home, and we find the, uh, where is it? I think it's, it might be in the installation guides actually. I can't even remember where it is myself. Right, okay. Um, okay, <laughs> it should be in here somewhere. Uh, let's see, fork. Oh, here we go, switching, yeah, okay. So in the Raspberry Pi installation guide, go to the, once you've installed it, there's an option to switch to the uh, official Raspberry Pi kernel fork. Personally, I don't recommend it because Slackware is an open source upstream distribution. And um, yeah, I'm not, not a fan of using kernel forks. That's not how it's supposed to work in the, in the ecosystem, at least in my opinion. Um, but, there are benefits to using the Raspberry Pi kernel fork, which generally are that there's additional support for hardware and some bug fixes as well. So some, in some ways it works better than the official Linux Torvalds kernel. But again, it shouldn't be like that. But hey. Um, so now we, it tells you how to do this. If we, we click here, um, yeah, there's a bit of background information here. And it tells you how to go about transitioning to the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. So I'm not gonna walk through this. Uh, that's not the purpose of this video. Um, but just to show you, this is, this is an option. It's fully documented. And you know, you've got some information about how to set it up and what to change. So that's there. So what we're gonna do now is upgrade to those packages. Right, so let's mount the, um, and they're, they're stored in the experimental directory. I don't need to show you this because it's all in the documentation. But here we go, so we've got the latest kernel packages that were built yesterday. So we can just, oh, I didn't need to upgrade the kernel source. That's gonna make it take longer now. But anyway, I've started it, so I won't interrupt it. Okay, so it's the moment of truth. We have still the um, Raspberry Pi running the official Linus Torvalds kernel on the right-hand side. It's running XFCE, it's stable, seems good. And we've now upgraded to the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. So I'm just gonna reboot 
uh, turn it, yeah. I'm just going to reboot the machine into that, so we'll see that disappear there. And uh, so we'll now boot into the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. And because of the configuration, um, we will lose the serial access once the kernel boots. Um, I think that that is configurable. I just haven't configured it um, because on the mainline kernel, that's the official kernel that we ship with Slackware, you get both. You get the serial and you get the um, uh, HDMI support as well. But that's okay. Uh, so let's see. And we can always tell that it's the Raspberry Pi kernel fork because it has the Raspberry Pi logos or the, the Raspberry, yeah, the Raspberry Pi logos uh, on the frame buffer. There we go. So you see four there, which represents four cores. And you can see, yeah, we've lost the serial access there, but okay, it's fine. Um, you'll see a few errors most likely whilst we boot uh, because, I haven't seen any actually. There probably were some that scrolled off, but um, that's because well, that was fast. <laughs> that's because um, there, there will be some errors when you when you boot, and that's just because the Linux kernel uh, module loader will try to load modules that are not within the Slackware. Uh, rather, that the Linux kernel module loader will try to load modules that aren't in the Raspberry Pi kernel fork, and uh, we don't have any way of detecting which kernels which. I mean, I could make it detect it, but. This is a kernel fork. It's not. Uh, it's not a main piece of the um, distribution. But there we go. So we can see that it's booted. Um, it looks good to me. Okay. I'm now going to use Package Tool to change the default window manager. So I can run Package Tool. So scroll to the bottom, run that script, and then just change that to be KDE like that. Exit. Now there is another way of doing it. You can just CD into etc. X11, X in it, and then you can see that it's just a symlink in etc. Slash X11 slash X in it directory. That's all you do. So now I'll just switch over to another serial console and log in here as my pleb account. Run start X, and hopefully we should see KDE load. For a long time, the uh, mainstream Linus Torvalds kernel hasn't worked with KDE, it just crashes, KDE crashes. Uh, and it's only worked with the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. So, at the moment, let's see how we are with this. Usually this would crash almost instantly upon boot. Uh, you can see that it hasn't, so that's good. Okay, I'm not going to do any other tests with this at the moment. Um, so we'll log out from here. Okay, log out. Okay. Good. Okay. Now I'm going to switch back to the root user. Here it is. Mount. Should I put it on a history? Mount. Devel arm slack slack a arch slack where a upgrade kernel kern star r it's dead okay kernel don't need the firmware yeah there we go okay so now I'm reverting to the Linus Torvalds kernel the official Slackware kernel um, and then I'll reboot back because I just want to make sure that the transition process works so I know that you can roll forwards. Well, I wouldn't say it's forwards. I should say it was more sideways. You can roll sideways into the uh, Raspberry Pi kernel fork. And um, then you want to sort of roll sideways back <laughs> the other direction, back into the, uh, into the official kernel. So that's what I'm going to do now and just verify those um, paths. It's now in the post-installation phase of the um, upgrade process for the kernel. You'll see that it's erroring with a few um, mod probe errors here. This is normal and it's documented in the uh, in the transition guide. So we don't need to be concerned about that at all. All right, so that's complete. So we can now reboot again like that and find ourselves hopefully back into the Linus Torvalds official kernel in a minute or two. 
And at this point, we should also start to see the um, boot process again on the serial console. And again, with the official kernel, we'll see the kernel boot process as well over the serial console. So you can see the U-boot bootloader booting there. And you can also see it reflected on the serial console. You get to see the serial console first. Okay, so the frame buffer has now loaded. And so we can now see the boot process on the uh, HDMI monitor as well. There we go. So what we'll do now, just finally, just out of curiosity really, does KDE work with the official mainline kernel? Let's find out. I've got no idea. My guess is it probably doesn't, but because <laughs> it hasn't done for so long. Um, but you never know. Maybe those fixes have made it upstream. Let's see. We'll know about it pretty quickly uh, because it just explodes. <laughs> there we go, look, see? Yeah, still doesn't work. There we go. So, yeah, if you want to use KDE at the moment, you need to use the Linux kernel fork on the Raspberry Pi 4. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, if you managed to stay with us all the way through to the end, um, again, thank you very much for your support uh, for the project. It really helps to keep things going and um, and I enjoy you know participating in the community. I don't always have as much time as I used to do, um, but as you can see, I mean, this video is almost an hour long and that's edited. So there is quite a lot of work that goes into building this open source project and maintaining it. So um, happy to be with you guys in the community. Thanks a lot for your support and I'll see you in the next video. Take care everyone, bye-bye.